I got asked some questions that kind of anything looks like a puzzle, man, I'm, I'm done. I have to go home and I sit there and I just stare at a wall and I just think about it. And then my mouth is usually half open. Eventually it'll come to me. The Lord has to, you know, it takes him a while, you know, <laughs> get through my thick head, I guess. But I brought a Jewish calendar and uh, Sister Mary Ann provided uh, this to me. This really was a great help in my study. <laughs> it really is a good help. Anyway, uh, first let's talk about the complexity of the Jewish calendar. Uh, one of the things we're going to find out is I'm not going to be able to work everything out to the day, and there's a reason for that. Uh, there are, in a Jewish calendar year, there are one of six numbers of how many days are in that year. For example, there may be 353 days, 354 days, 355 days. Then if it's leap year, there could be 383 days, 384 days, 385 days. So you see that it kind of all depends where you're at in their cycle. And <clears throat> the, um, the other thing is, that when you, you have a sacred calendar or the religious calendar and you have the civil calendar, okay? This is the month Nisan that we've been talking about. It says it's the first sacred month, but it's the seventh civil month. They, what do they do? They do that to confuse me? One of the things we need to make clear that when we're dealing with Daniel's 70 weeks, because God said the first month will be the month Abib, which is Nisan, then that's the calendar we're going by, the sacred, okay, not the civil. Um, you say, well, what happened? Well, I want to get ahead of myself. i got a couple of notes here. I want to make sure I cover everything. So we have the sacred calendar. We have the civil calendar. Um, when we come to the, the, the birth of Christ, or not the birth of Christ, but the death of Christ, and the question was, he's 33 and a half. Why is that? Well, first of all, Okay. He is born at Tabernacles. There's exactly six months difference between Tabernacles and Passover. Remember, we are starting at Passover, year after year, Passover to Passover to Passover. So when Jesus Christ uh, is crucified on the cross, because he is born at Tabernacles, there's a six-month offset. Do you all see that? Tishrai and Nisan are six months apart. And that's the month he's born in. He's born at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he's 33 and a half, but it's exactly 483 years. Why? Because don't confuse his birth and his, uh, his age with what we're studying as far as the, the 70 weeks. We are going Passover to Passover. And Passover to Passover is 483 years and the Messiah is cut off. And because he's born six months earlier, it makes him 33 and a half. That's the answer to that question. Does that make sense? Whew, please tell me it makes sense. If not, just stare at a wall like I do and it'll come to you. Okay? <clears throat> um, here's the interesting thing. When we go over to Tishrei, the Feast of Tabernacles is always the 15th day. Now remember, their, their calendar is like our calendar in a lot of ways when we have a set day that like December 25th is Christmas. They have the same thing. Their days are set too. But because they have a leap year where they, they, they add an additional month, everything flies forward on our calendar. But to them it's still, you know, the 15th of Tishri is the beginning of Tabernacles. But uh, notice it says there that the uh, Tishri is the seventh sacred month, but it's the first civil month. Isn't that odd? Daniel 70 weeks is based on the sacred, but then when, even, when it comes to the birth of Christ at Tabernacles, they have their civil calendar based on His. It's like they couldn't get away from it. So don't let that confuse you, because <clears throat> it did confuse me last week. Did, did that make sense or... I'll, I'll, I'll. All right. 
and we will be referencing that again. What we tried to do, uh, we never got through it all, we were talking about the commandment. Because the timeline begins with the commandment to go forth and restore and build Jerusalem. We know that's in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Nehemiah is before King Artaxerxes. And uh, out of the blue, just, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he says, uh, you know, what do you want to do? And then Nehemiah prays and he said, you know, I need to go back and build the city and the walls. Really what he's telling Artaxerxes. Well, Artaxerxes sends him back. And that begins the timeline. And you have to understand, when, when Daniel is given this prophecy about the 70 weeks, at the end of that 70 weeks, the kingdom is to, be, is the kingdom is to come. That's, that's what's supposed to happen. So when we're looking at this countdown, the closer we get to the end of it, the, the, the kingdom of heaven should be on earth. Well, obviously that didn't happen, and we'll, we'll talk about why that didn't happen and why God stopped the timetable, but it's marching along here, okay? It's marching along pretty well. Let's, um, we talked about who the prophecy is written to, not to confuse it with the church, but it's written to uh, His people, the people of Israel, to the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, we talked about the actual amount of time in the timetable and the fact that the Bible tells us in Genesis 29, verse 25 to 28, that a week can be seven years. Okay? That's your basis for your interpretation. Now, we know it's, it fits because history tells us that it fits. Unlike Miller, who thought he had it, <laughs> and when the Lord didn't come back, you know, he had egg on his face. Well, we know this fits because how do you know? Well... It says there that the seven weeks was the first, um, and not di division, but, well, it's like a division, but um, it's not the word I'm think trying to think of, um, where he delineates between the rest of it. He said seven weeks to rebuild the city, which is seven times seven, 49 years. That's exactly what happened. That's how long it took them to rebuild the wall in the city. It took them 49 years. Okay, we have a historical record of that. The next thing is the 62 weeks, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, so we talked about um, uh, the commandment when it started. We talked about the different partitions is the word I was looking for. And the fact that we have four partitions mentioned. We have seven weeks. We have 62 weeks. We have one week. And then he talks about in the midst of the week. And those are going to be important and understanding how the, end, the rest of that thing falls out at the end. So, and not inserting anything he didn't say. Not putting something in there that's not in there. And that's going to be important. Um, and I say that because when he says, after 69 weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, 62 and 7 is 69, that's 483 years, he didn't add a half a year or a half a week in there anywhere. He didn't say 69 and a half. He said after 69 weeks. So <clears throat> you got to be careful about adding something in there. It'll, it'll, it, well, we'll see how it'll mess up. It won't work. It just won't work. But anyway, look at verse Daniel chapter 9 if you're not there already. And look at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So you have a list of seven specific things that are supposed to be fulfilled. Now we could take this list and I could probably figure out a way to spiritually apply every one of them to you and I as a Christian. But is that who the prophecy is written to? It's written to Israel. And what you're really going to find out is not one of seven have been fulfilled. None of them have been fulfilled. And, I, and, and probably the, the reason why the, the, the 70th week, the last part of it was postponed, is because none of that was fulfilled. Israel rejected their Messiah. They killed their king. It's hard to have a kingdom when you kill your king and you're against him. <clears throat> you say, well, doesn't it say he's going to die? Yeah, but it didn't say that Israel had to kill him. Listen, you give Rome long enough, they'd have done it. 
Once they would have been heralding him as the Messiah. Let me move this out of the way. I'm hearing it. Once they'd have heralded him as the Messiah uh, and, and, and the king of all the earth, I guarantee you uh, Rome would have come after him. Uh, the Lord would have uh, had his way and, uh, and, and Jesus Christ would have had his hour. There's no doubt about that. But let's look at those seven things. Number one is to finish the transgression. Um, my transgression's finished. I'm saved. But Israel's isn't. Now, he's paid for their transgression, but they haven't finished transgressing. Uh, matter of fact, the wrath of God has been, a, been on them for about two millennia now because of that. They said, His blood be upon us, upon our children. You would never find any, any people on earth more persecuted than the Jew. Uh, Romans eleven twenty six, he says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Uh, eventually, the Lord's going to write that thing. Um, and, you know, he certainly, he certainly gave it a good try. I think that everything that you see back there in the Gospels is a legitimate offer. When Jesus Christ says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's at hand. If he says the kingdom of God's at hand, it's at hand. Everything that needed to be fulfilled and written up to that time would have been fulfilled. The, the, the offer is legitimate. Does he know what's going to happen? Yeah, he may he probably does. He, he knows what's going to happen. He knows they're going to reject. But the offer is legitimate. <clears throat> you know when somebody makes you an offer but it's not real, when you say, well, you, you weren't going to do it anyway, that's kind of, you know. But if, if the offer is legitimate, and then you turn it down, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is to make an end of sins. Romans eleven twenty seven. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And notice that we're getting this revelation in Romans chapter eleven in the Pauline epistles. Romans eleven is is the chapter in the Bible that tells you what happened. That uh, that uh, blindness in part and the, and and the setting aside of Israel uh, happened because of their rejection. Just don't be so foolish as to think it's permanent. Say, why do you say that? Because God made promises to Abraham and there were no strings attached. He has to fulfill them. One way or the other, and he'll do it too. You just give him some time, he'll take care of it. The third thing was to make reconciliation for iniquity. Hebrews 2.17 says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, he made reconciliation in the fact that he went to the cross to save his people from their sins. The Bible tells us that. But Israel has not received that reconciliation. They have not been reconciled. And this is all about Israel. I, keep, I bring this up because you're going to... I don't know what it is with some Baptists, but they're bent on making everything in the Bible apply to the church. You know, and that, that really messes up your theology. Uh, I, you know, it was explained to me very simply that the church age is a parenthesis of God bringing in a kingdom. And if you keep that in mind, you'll get your Bible right. Now, you make it more than that, then you'll, you'll have yourself stealing the promises of the Jews and, and, and uh, keeping them for yourself. I've always said if you could take... <clears throat> If you could go from Acts 7, where instead of stoning Stephen, they, they listened to his preaching and put a parenthesis there and a parenthesis after Philemon, where you go into Hebrews and bring it together, <clears throat> they're right on track. We'd have been through the millennium. We'd be in eternity right now. Well, I don't know. We, we, might, we probably wouldn't have existed. Uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness, number four, uh, he, he said in Hebrews 1.8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, you know, we know that there's righteousness up there. But how about down here? Surely you all know better than that, right? If you watch five minutes of the news, you know better than that. I mean, there, there's no righteousness in the earth right now. I mean, you know, it's, it's horrible. And, God, and when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to bring righteousness uh, he says it would be the scepter of his kingdom. Number five was to seal up the vision. And of course, this is going to be concerning Israel. 
He said in Daniel 12, 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And he saith unto, unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy uh, of this book, for the time is at hand. And I believe that was in Revelations. And so you have, in Daniel 12, 4, he's told to seal it up. And in, in Revelation, he's told not to seal it. You see, Daniel's kind of a sealed book till the time of the end. And then that thing's just going to unfold. And we get glimpses, and we, get, we can get, a, a, I think because we have the Spirit of God, we can get a, a, a pretty good understanding. But there, we still look through a, a glass darkly. But then one day, face to face. And that ain't face to face with a book, that's face to face with the man Christ Jesus. And we'll all understand it then. There, there won't be any puzzles in my mind anymore. All the cobwebs will be cleaned out, and I'll understand all this perfectly. But um, when he says to seal up the vision, in that, in that phrase, he's talking about completing it, completing the vision. He says to seal up the vision and the prophecy. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, interesting, um, you know, the, the chapter on love um, I still like the word charity. <clears throat> uh, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, he's not talking about them failing in the sense that they don't come to pass. Um, he's talking in the sense that they're all, they're all fulfilled, fulfilled and they cease. He says, uh, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which in part shall be done away. Now, a lot of folks think the Scriptures was that which is uh, 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 perfect has come, but it's not. And the Scriptures are perfect. But he's talking about, he's talking about Jesus Christ coming because that's when the prophecies and the vision is going to be fulfilled. Um, and then it's going to be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Every time you find that reference face to face, especially I believe it's in 2nd and 3rd John, or I think it's in 2nd and 3rd John, um, the individual's talking about meeting with a person, not with a page. So... That's when those things are done away. That's why the Bible says, Thou abideth faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these is charity. Why? Faith is going to vanish away, and so is hope. Why? Hope's going to be fulfilled. We're going to get resurrected and stand before our Lord. We're no longer going to have to have faith in Him. We're going to seem. So what's left? Charity. That's why that thing continues on and the rest of them fail. It's not fail in the sense that it, it fails, some, fails you, but in the sense that it's going to go away. So when we talk about prophecy and we talk about the vision, that's not concluded till what? We're talking uh, in the millennium, they won't prophesy. So at the second advent, if you prophesy in the millennium, uh, it's the death penalty. The devil, I don't know if the devil's talking to you from the bottomless pit or what. <clears throat> Just watch how many jalapenos eat before you go to sleep and pizza and all that kind of stuff. The last one is, number seven, is to anoint the most holy. Uh, I found a reference over in Psalm 92, verse 10. It says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of, 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 a, of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And one of these days, uh, they, they've, crowned, they've crowned their Messiah once with a crown of thorns. One day Israel will crown him the most holy. Uh, matter of fact, they've already, I've seen it, the crown, I've seen a picture of it. They already have the crown for the high priest. A golden crown. They've already created it. So they're getting all this stuff ready. Now, I don't know, I don't know if that's going to be the same one they're going to crown him with. If it sits on the head of the Antichrist, I doubt the Lord's going to accept it. <laughs> You'd have to wash it down with some good bleach or something. I don't know. But, um, but one of these days, Israel will anoint Jesus Christ as the most holy. All right, so those seven things are supposed to uh, are are what's supposed to be fulfilled once we get through these seventy weeks. None of it's been fulfilled yet. All seven of them need to to finish, and they haven't yet. <clears throat> now, 
The sixth thing we wanted to talk about was are there, are there any prophetical events that occur that show the progression of the timetable? Well, of course, you have the rebuilding of Jerusalem under Nehemiah. That's one for the first step. He said, you know, uh, seven weeks to rebuild the city and the wall even in troublous times. If you read Nehemiah, that's exactly what they had. Troublous times. They had all kinds of enemies. Everybody giving them a hard time. In fact, they had to work with a weapon in one hand and a, and a, and a building tool in the other. I don't know how you do that. You know, but they did it. <clears throat> but they, 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 they finished the work. Uh, we have the birth of the Messiah. Now, even though even though this timetable does not pinpoint his birth, it does pinpoint his death. But still, the fact that the Messiah shows up is an indicator that this timeline is working. Now, sadly, there aren't any Jews around that are looking for him. One of the most amazing things you'll, you'll see is they're, 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 that no one's looking for him except for a bunch of Gentiles. And there's a couple of Israel, but we'll talk about that in a second. So then you have the death of the Messiah. Falls right on time, right to the day. Right to the day. Remember, we're talking about Nisan, we're talking about Passover, from Passover to Passover, 483 years, right on Passover, the Messiah is cut off. Just like it says. And at that point, there is one week remaining. Now, we've got to figure out how that thing falls out the rest of the way. And if you're looking at that chart close enough, you're probably figuring some things out. Uh, one other thing that takes place that kind of tells us about the prophetical events is, um, is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And I'm, I'll mention more probably about this later, but this is going to be a precursor. This is outside of this timeline. Because if, if this timeline had ran its course without any break, without God putting any stop into it, it would have ended in 40 A.D. That's 490 years. But in 40 A.D., did everything that, that, that we just read come to pass? Obviously not. Okay? Uh, in 70 A.D., you have another picture and a precursor and, uh, and Jesus Christ prophesying of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. So you have a precursor of, what was go of what's going to happen in the future. Actually, it's an amazing prophecy. Uh, and I believe I'm going to discuss that a little later. Yes. All right, how do we know that this timetable was even known or understood by anyone else? Turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and look at verse uh, 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Well, there's one. He might have been the only one in Israel looking for him, besides another woman we'll talk about here. But you see, somebody's waiting for the consolation of Israel. How do they know? How do they know? And he said that the Holy Ghost would, uh, that he would not see death till he had seen uh, uh, the consolation of Israel. But he had to know, that he had to been watching for a reason. He had to been waiting for a reason. And it's because of this timeline. Uh, look at verse 36 to 38. He says there, and there was uh, one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of. Phanuel, I guess, of the tribe of Aser. And she was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks. This is when they're presenting Jesus uh, uh, making the sacrifice, um, actually for her, not for him. But... Um, uh, she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to uh, spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So evidently there's a few that are looking for him. Now 
what's funny is that you know you got two there but that may have been it there may be a few more uh, when the wise men show up they figured the thing out and uh, when they even tell uh, tell the uh, Herod and the, uh, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees or whatever, when they tell them they'd seen the star, they still don't get it. But these wise men who came from the east and probably Babylon. Now, how would they know about it? Well, Daniel is in Babylon, writing in Babylon, and even part of the... Uh, of what he wrote was in Chaldean. Majority of Hebrew, but some of it was in Chaldean. So these wise men would have had access to at least the book of Daniel. Uh, no doubt there's a, 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 the Torah laying around, a few, a, few, a few of the Torah laying around, the first five books of Moses. And they could have, they could have surmised all kinds of things just from that. But look at Numbers 24:17. Numbers 24, 17. And again, I don't know why Balaam gets to, gets to do these prophecies and say the, he's got some wonderful verses. <laughs> anyway, he says there, uh, and it says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel, shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. But notice there, a star out of Jacob. These men are stargazers. But you've got to be knowing when to look up. If they, have, if they have Daniel's prophecy in front of them in just a few verses of Scripture, maybe, some, maybe they have some of Isaiah, they would be able to figure out that the one that's coming is the Messiah, born of a virgin and uh, king of the Jews, a scepter, uh, shall rise out of, uh, of, uh, of Israel. And they would have been looking for a star, and all of a sudden here the star appears. They know exactly what's going on. How would they know? This timetable. Doc says they could have known within two years. Now, I can't prove that. I can prove that they could have been looking as early as 20 years. They could have made it their life, lifelong ambition to watch and see if that prophecy gets fulfilled. But there's indicators. Uh, indicators of uh, when Jesus Christ could enter the temple and start to minister inside that temple. Uh, he had to be 30 years of age because that's what it says in the Old Testament five times, I believe, in the book of Numbers. Uh, there's, there's some other things that would have been an indicator to them of being able to figure that out. But the wise men were looking for him. But if you if but when those wise men and, and when they do show up, he is uh, he is in a, a house and he is a young child. He's no longer a baby. It takes it, it takes him a while to find him, but nobody else is looking. They said, "Well, you know, where is he? He's born king of the Jews." Herod's only interested because he wants to kill him. And the scribes they they go ahead and give him the the final piece to the puzzle. And tell him that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephratah. Probably didn't have the book of Micah. Had they had the book of Micah, they would have known, wouldn't they? Of course, that was written a little bit later, so... At least they have an idea. Of course, the Lord, that star ends up leading them right to where the child is. But isn't it funny that none of them Jews, none of them Jews that figured that out, other than a, 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 a couple older ones like Simeon and Anna, and the rest of them totally missed it. But yet here come some wise men rolling into town. And they're saying, where is he that's born king of the Jews? They're all excited. You don't see the scribes first. He's, what? What? You know? All you see is Herod say, king of what? It's hard to preach one time, ain't nobody king in it but me. And that's why, we, that's why he says, when you find him... <coughs> Come back and let me know so I can go and worshiping. Of course, you know what Herod ends up doing, don't you? Killing all the males two years and younger in all the coast of Israel. 
Wouldn't it be something here, Jesus Christ, other than John the Baptist who was raised in the wilderness? They're the only two within two years of, of their peers. Jesus Christ at his very age pictured the resurrection because all the other kids were dead. All the other males were dead. Anyway, um, then look at Matthew chapter 3. We know this is proceeding along because when Jesus comes and, and John the Baptist, they come preaching the kingdom. In uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, this is John the Baptist. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Sound to me like it's coming, you know, coming down to the wire. And then in verse, uh, what is it, 17? No, not verse 17. Um, yeah, verse 17. That's not it. Um, verse... Four seven four seventeen, uh, and it says from from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Two witnesses there. That's another indicator. Then in Acts chapter one verse six, all the disciples are asking about it. It says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So there are some that, are, that, are, that have a clue and are cued in on what's going on. And even the disciples are saying, Lord, is this thing going to be fulfilled now? He says, not for you to know. Why? Israel's given actually three chances for, for things to work out. Their, their rejection of God the Father in the Old Testament when they rejected Him as their King. The Gospels, when God the Son shows up, they reject Him and crucify Him on a cross. And then they get one more chance. And that's why He says, it's not for you to know. You're going to have to wait. Why? We're going to see what happens here. And what happens is a man full of the Holy Ghost preaches a message. And instead of saying, you're right, we're just going to repent, get right with God, they stone Him to death. And God says, I'm stopping that timetable Whew, right there. And we'll see that. And we'll see that everything will perfectly, well, pretty much perfectly match all the way up. Like I said, them calendars. Whew. I hate calendars now. Don't even like to look at one. Oh, the other thing is, on these calendars, a Jewish day begins in the evening. Evening in the morning, that's because God, that's how God's day is. Us Gentiles are backwards. Y'all think this is backward. No, we're the one backwards. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, that's how that goes. When I went online, I found another Hebrew calendar. It didn't match this one. And this is a Hebrew calendar. It was all set by one day. Like one chose, because they're trying to line it up with our days, I guess. I don't know what they're doing. But anyway, one chose the evening and one chose the morning, I guess. And they're all set by a day. Weird. I'm like, what do I do with that? They don't, they, you know, two Hebrew calendars that don't even agree. <laughs> All I know is I hurt myself thinking this through, okay? I hurt myself. I'm just not good at that kind of thing. All right, now the next thing um, that we need to talk about, we talked about the commandment, now let's talk about the cutting off of the Messiah. Uh, in uh, verse 26 of uh, Daniel chapter 9, it says, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And let's just stop right there because we have a colon and then we have something else that takes place there. So we have uh, the cutting off of the Messiah. Now, I, I don't know where I, some uh, pinhead uh, tried to say that the word cutting off was castration. I think it's, uh, they've tried to prove that in the NIV. Uh, that's not what happened. Genesis chapter 9. Somebody tells you something like that, you need to go to your Bible. Genesis 9 11. I'm just saying this because I've heard this before and I don't want anybody to think. It says, I will establish my covenant with you. Genesis 9 verse 11. Um, Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more, or any more be a flood to destroy the earth. 
And that's obviously that they weren't castrated, they were drowned. Okay? So when he talks about the Messiah being cut off, he's talking about the Messiah dying. Pretty clear. Okay. Just threw that in. So when so let me ask you a question. In Galatians 5.12, when Paul says, I would that they were cut off which trouble you. So that's the verse they try to say that Paul wanted to castrate them, which I think is kind of gross. But you know what Paul was saying? I wish they were dead. The ones that trouble you, the ones that are, that, are, that are a problem to you, the ones that are feeding you false doctrine. He said, I would that they were cut off. I wish they were dead. Now, that's, you say, well, that's not a Christian, very Christian attitude. <laughs> Well, when the, when the whole world's going to hell and you got these cults down there leading them there, maybe your mommy and daddy or maybe your brothers and sisters or maybe your children, I could wish them dead. Now, I don't, you know, there, there's people out there that just need to hear the gospel and be saved, but then there are, there are some that, he said about the Pharisees, he said, you make your, your converts twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. In other words, the convert ends up being a worse heretic than the priest that led him to or that led him to the religion, priest or whatever they are. Okay, <clears throat> don't want to get off into that. So simple math would have given anyone searching the scriptures how long uh, they would have known that 483 years would elapse, and that. Um, this started with a decree of Artaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 2. Now here's one thing that is certain. You cannot begin the timeline at Passover in Nehemiah chapter 2 and come forward 483 years and wind up in the midst of a week. Okay? If you wind up in the midst of a week at at three and a half years, you don't land on what? You do not land on Passover. And Brother Brian Donovan has taught that where the thing ends is at 400 and, uh, 486 and a half years or 69 and a half weeks. It does not work. If you start at Passover and there's no break, it just goes from year to year to year. Well, how are you going to wind up in the middle of a week with only three and a half years remaining, which is what he teaches? How are you going to wind up in the middle of a week here? You're not. But you do wind up at the end of the 69th week exactly. I know some of you are looking at me. Um, it's a little bit um, more detailed than some Bible studies. <laughs> Uh, and I'm trying to answer some questions that some folks have about whether there are three and a half years remaining or, or seven years or what's remaining. That's what we're going to figure out. But I'm also going to tell you this. You can't start at Passover, go 69 weeks and have the Messiah cut off at 483 years with seven years remaining. You can't start up at um, Passover and wind up on tabernacles. That won't work either. You see, this timeline should work. It should work perfectly. In other words, Passover to Passover would be one year, right? Okay. This, they're saying, uh, uh, this is Larkin, Dr. Ruckman, believes that the 70th week, uh, or the uh, 69th week, ended here, and God stopped the timetable here with one full week remaining. Now, they're not going to be burned at the stake for it, but they're saying that's as much as they understand about it. The problem is, if you pick it up where it left off, it won't work. In fact, I don't care what uh, feast you start up with, seven full years later, you're going to land on that same feast, right? So, if it would have to... I guess if it started at Tabernacle, seven full years. But we'll see something else. Here's the problem. What feast, if God's going to do everything by those feasts, what feast would God rapture the church at? Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. That's not Tabernacles.
patience, it all works out. If you can follow it long enough and I don't confuse you. Um, let's see here, I'll get ahead of myself. Now, uh, Brother Donovan saying that only three and a half years remains um, versus either um, a full seven years or, or a good or a good bit of that. But yet the Bible gives you the type or example of seven years. Now, one of the things, you know, if, you've, if you have ever read the, the book of Job, Job has 42 chapters in it, which pictures the great tribulation of 42 months. That's, that's this section right here, okay? 1,260 days, 42 months, you know, three and a half years. Uh, but yet Job is on the ground how many days? He's on the ground seven days. Uh, also, Joseph, his prophecies, when he's prophesying to Pharaoh, tells him there's going to be seven bad years in Genesis 41:30. Another example is Nebuchadnezzar. This is now Nebuchadnezzar, like Pharaoh, is a type of the Antichrist. And you remember when the Lord uh, made him, you know, crawl on the ground like an ox? You know how long he behaves like a beast? Seven times. Here's what I'm going to tell you. The Great Tribulation is 42 months. Jesus said over there in Matthew chapter 24, and then shall be Great Tribulation. But when he says that in relation to what? Good times? Or then shall be Great Tribulation. So what I'm telling you is, I don't have a problem with calling all of this the Tribulation period. As long as you understand that the last 42 months is the great tribulation. Okay? Because now Christians are getting beat up for saying that. They're getting beat up for saying that the tribulation period is seven years. Say, no, 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 it's three and a half. Well, I believe it's the whole seven years. It's just not all great tribulation. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, and where I'm going to leave you with that is there's not three and a half years remaining and there's not a full seven. In fact, the Bible tells you exactly what is remaining. You just had to look. And when you divide that up and see how that thing falls out, we're going to see the feast line up, the days line up, the calendar line up all the way. Okay. Any questions? You're all just like, whoa.